Well, the Lord be with you. Friends, welcome to worship on this uh, beautiful Sunday morning. It's uh, fall, and it's fantastic, and it's uh, a good weather, and hopefully a lot of good things happening uh, this week and this weekend. Um, do you see the announcements in, that are printed in the bulletin? I know I want to uh, highlight the uh, this coming weekend is the um, uh, goodness the yard sale. Uh, Linda, can you tell us a little bit more? Remind us again about the box the. Yeah, so 5.30 to 6.30 during the, this week. If you have anything to drop off, uh, we'll be at the fire department. Saturday, 7 a.m. All right. <laughs> That's a great question. So setup is 7 a.m., and we'll start selling things at 8 a.m. Yeah, thank you. I'll make that so no close, uh, please. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other announcements to lift up at yeah. this time? Yeah. I've got, I've got one. Um, I just like to call your attention to, to this row here and this row here. There's not an infant back in the nursery, okay? Uh, Michaela, of course, is back there taking care of the nursery. I'm supposed to be leaving a lesson with her this morning, okay? The problem is, is you have, it's not a problem. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and that, that all those sign-ups are, are on the bulletin board, including liturgists. Um, if you want to help lead Children's Church, I think there's still opportunities, or, or someone can plug you in. Um, there's always room. So there's, there's still plenty of, of places to, to sign up. Uh, so thank you. Thanks for reminding us. Any other announcements? All right. Well, seeing none, let us prepare our hearts to worship the Lord.
hear now our call to worship from Psalms 24. The earth is the Lord in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has found it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend unto the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an <clears throat> idol, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessings from the Lord and righteousness from God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, lift up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Come and let us worship him with him. 293, this is my father's world. but he who confesses and forsake them will find compassion. May we have the prayer of confession. In the light of this teaching, let us offer our prayers of confession. Trusting God does not always come easy when each day we are faced with the ugliness of the world. We do not believe that love conquers fear. We are not convinced that power comes through weakness. We cannot conceive how God could heal us. Forgive our lack of faith, O oh God. Renew our trust in you, for we will be disciples of Christ. In whose name we pray. Amen. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but the people who fear the Lord are those to be praised. Hear the good news. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven, and we can live in peace. Thanks be to God.
Church, what is it that you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From hence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You all may be seated, and I'll call young children forward. <laughs> Hi. Hi, you want to sit there? All right. Have, uh, have you ever played the game Simon Says? Yeah, you know the rules. Do you know the rules, Ivy? Have you played Simon Says? Hi, I know you haven't played Simon Says. Do you want to play Simon Says? All right, let's stand up real quick. We'll play a quick game. All right, so the rule says... If Simon says something, you have to do it, right? Okay, yeah, Simon says, touch your head. <gasps> Teddy, can you touch your head? Oh, good job. Simon says, stomp your feet, stomp your feet, stomp your feet. <gasps> oh, good job. Simon says, wave your hands. Yeah. All right, and Simon says, walk this way. Let's walk, walk this way, walk this way. Yeah, walk this way. Yeah, you can go around. Yeah, keep going. Oh, Simon said it. Oh, no. All right. That's all right. So Simon says is a fun game where you do what, what Simon tells you to do, right? Now, what if, what if Simon said we had to go play in the road? We don't do that, right? No, we don't play in roads, right? Teddy, you hold hands when we cross the street, right? Oh, you better. <laughs> ah, you're older now. You know how to look both ways. My daddy lets me. Yeah. <laughs> if Simon said to jump off the bridge, that would not be good, right? No, we don't do that. So the funny thing about Simon is... I jump off bridges. No, you don't jump off bridges. <laughs> Simon is, is fun game, but we can't always trust Simon, right? Jesus says... I am the way and the truth. There sometimes is water in there. Simon will, can't always tell us what's good or what's right. And sometimes we don't listen to Simon, kind of like how Eden, you didn't listen to Simon when we walked around, right? I'm going to doubt. That's okay. When Jesus, in a way, Jesus is like Simon, but a lot better. Because Jesus also says that he's the truth. What, do you know what telling the truth is? What is telling the truth? You should tell the truth. Because mm -hmm. you did something and you should have done it. You don't lie in the whole time. Yeah. You just say, I am the truth. Yeah, so lying is kind of like trying to hide something, right? I got all this. <laughs> when, when Jesus doesn't lie to us, he tells us what the truth is. And so, you know, while we did the silly mo motions with Simon. When Jesus tells us what's what to do. <laughs> yeah, because he's watching over you. Jesus does that too. Jesus is watching over us. Jesus is telling us what, what is right and what's wrong. And so that's why when we follow what Jesus says, you know, we don't always have to follow what Simon says, but we, we can follow what Jesus says. And Jesus helps us to follow it you, with his Holy Spirit. Oh, we, have to it. we should. We should definitely try and follow it as best we can. So can you pray with me? Yeah. All right, we're going we're gonna to pray for the Holy Spirit's help. Dear God, we ask that you give us your Holy Spirit. I know you've given him to us, and, and Lord, we need the help to listen to him. He helps us know what is the right path. He helps us to understand what the truth of Jesus is. 
And so, Lord, I pray that as we continue to grow, grow in, in faithfulness and grow in, in wisdom and knowledge, Lord, I pray that we can grow uh, to better listen to your Holy Spirit. So, Lord, we pray all this in his name. Amen. Amen. Good job. Thank you. Please join me in prayer. Holy Spirit, as your word is read and preached, pass among your gathered people, opening minds to increase understanding, opening hearts to bind us together in your love. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. The Old Testament comes from Proverbs 1 through 21. Chapter 1, 20 through 33. Wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the market, she raises her voice. At the head of the noisy street, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gate, she speaks. Oh, long, oh, simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffs delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? If you turn to my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you because I have called and you refuse to listen. Have stretched out my hands and no one has heeded because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof. I will also laugh at your calamity I will mock when terror strikes you, when terror strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish comes upon you, then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, would have none of my counsel and despise all my reproof. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their way and have their fill of their own devices. For the simple are killed by their turning away and the complacency of fools destroys them. But whoever listens to me will dwell secure and be at ease without dread of disaster. This is the word of the Lord.
may be seated. Thank you, choir. And now we enter the portion of our service. We lift up prayers for our families, for our friends, for the church, and for the world. You see the prayer request printed in the bulletin. Are there any others you wish to lift up at this time? Yeah, Mark. Yes, uh, Eddie Schneck. That's my, uh, my uncle Eddie. He's my mom's oldest brother. He had to have two uh, brain surgeries this past week because of uh, a bleeding issue. Um, and uh, he's been in intensive care. He is regaining strength the last two days. Uh, his eyes, as recognized, one or two people. So uh, he seems to be progressing. Like to lift up prayers for him. We'll certainly keep him in your in our prayers and certainly your family as well as you all uh, continue to pray for him and, and support him. So. Dennis? Uh, Mike Brady, uh, he's a veteran friend of ours. Uh, his uh, cancer uh, has come back and it's in his brain. Mm. Well, goodness, we'll certainly keep him and his family in our prayers and uh, pray that God, God be with him. Yeah, thank you. Yes, uh, Gary? We'll certainly keep her and our and her family in our prayers. Thank you, uh, my, Martha. Well, we'll certainly keep C E in our prayers. Yeah, thank you. And Jean, absolutely. Okay. Yes, ma'am. My uh, children's father, Chuck Glenn. He had back surgery this week, and, and that went okay, but he has some other health issues, and he's having a lot of respiratory problems and everything. We'll certainly he tested keep. negative for COVID, but he's not doing real well. Mm, goodness. Well, we'll certainly keep him and family, <laughs> pray for safety and healing. Yes. My uh, first one, Michelle, she um, has COVID. Um, she's on the road to recovery, but just the Certainly pray for her and is the rest of the family okay? Else good. good. All vaccinated, but she's still well, we'll dying. certainly keep her in our prayers. Yes, yeah, surely. Charity Mitchell, friend of mine, uh, he had his uh, jaw wide out this week, but he also has some cancer in his teeth. Mm -hmm. We'll pray for God's strength and healing in his life. Thank you. I know there's a uh, shower going on this afternoon so we certainly pray for uh, holly and andrew as we look forward to their nuptials pray everything goes well and they have a good time any others all right well seeing none let us bring these prayers to the lord heavenly father we come before you and we ask that you uh, give to us to to the world your peace, the, the peace that comes from above, for your loving kindness and, and our salvation. Lord, we, we pray. We pray that uh, you make known in our hearts that we are reconciled uh, with, uh, between you uh, and us because of Christ, who is our mediator. Lord, we pray that uh, we can see the, the daily outpouring of your loving kindness in our lives as the, the common grace you, you extend to us, the very uh, breath in our lungs, the food on our table, the, the fellowship that we share. Uh, and Lord, we pray for the recognition of your loving kindness through your, your sovereign grace, uh, the grace of our redemption, the grace of the gift of Christ, uh, who is our Redeemer. Lord, we know that these are, are gifts of your, uh, of your loving kindness and of your peace. And Lord, I pray that we recognize and honor you for these wonderful gifts. Lord, we pray for this a gathering of, of the faithful uh, who gather here this morning in this place and who gather all around the world. Your body, uh, one, one united force, all praising your name. Lord, I pray that you uh, give to us the, the strength to persevere, the strength to carry on, the, the strength to preach the gospel, to live the gospel. Lord, I, I pray for those of us who are aged or infirmed, those who are, are suffering, those who are lost. Lord, I pray that you bring healing and wholeness, that you bring deliverance, 
and that you allow us, brothers and sisters in the faith of this one body, to share that same compassion and love that you've shared with us. Lord, we pray for those in the world who are, are poor, those who are oppressed, those who are uh, unemployed, and those who are destitute, those imprisoned or held captive. Lord, I pray that you remember them and keep them. Lord, I pray that you help us uh, to bear witness to them. And Lord, I pray that uh, they can come to know the, the, the grace and the love and the mercy that you share through Christ our Savior. And so, Lord, I pray for deliverance in the times of affliction, whether these afflictions are, are mental, physical, emotional. Uh, Lord, I pray that uh, you deliver us from these things. You deliver us from temptation. You deliver us from, from all ills. And you deliver us into your realm. Lord, I pray that we can truly live as citizens of your kingdom. We are redeemed and forgiven, and Lord, that means we are changed. We are renewed by the transforming of our minds. Let us live as kingdom citizens, no longer focusing on uh, the, the selfish uh, desires and pleasures of our passions, but focusing on what is pleasing to you, what you desire and would have of us. And so, Lord, we pray that you uh, bring to us the Holy Spirit's calming presence into our hearts and into our lives. Fulfill now, O Lord, the petitions of our hearts, the supplications and intercessions that we lift before you. Lord, we know that you are truth and that the truth indeed will set us free. And so we pray boldly with the prayer that Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, our hymn, our next hymn is number 298. I invite you to join me in singing, There's a Wideness in God's Mercy. you to remain standing for the reading of God's word, which comes to us from the 14th chapter of the gospel according to Mark, verses 32 
through 36. Listen now to the good news of Christ. And they came to a place named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here until I have prayed. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be very distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. And he went a little beyond them and fell to the ground and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass him by. And he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for thee. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what thou wilt. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You all may be seated. Heavenly Father, I pray that you enter into our hearts this moment to listen closely to your word that we may hear, receive, and be transformed. <coughs> Lord, we pray all this in the name of our, Fa of our Son, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Again, we are still in the Thursday of Holy Week. Like I said, we're going to be in this uh, section at least for uh, the next chapter. We're going to be here for a while because this is a, a, an important moment in Jesus's ministry, specifically in his passion. Um, the post supper preparation that he has uh, received was for his passion. He is preparing himself for what is next. He knows what must happen. And so Jesus must prepare himself. And so he goes to Gethsemane to pray, a, a, a place uh, set outside of town to a nice uh, little quiet garden so that he can be with God. This is a, a, a quite a telling thing about prayer. And I want to talk a little bit about prayer uh, for a moment. Uh, sometimes it's important for us to go to that quiet place. That place where we need to get away from the hustle and bustle of the world, where we need to get away from the, the, the cares and concerns that are constantly being lobbed at us. Sometimes we just need to say, family, I, I need to go uh, quiet to a quiet place and pray. He, he leaves his disciples behind. Uh, he, he invites James, John, and Peter uh, first to come a little ways, and then he tells them, to, to, that he's going to go on a little further and have this time of prayer. Prayer is a powerful thing. Uh, prayer has a lot of power. We talk about the power of prayer. But there's one thing that prayer can't do. Prayer does not change God's mind. But rather, it changes ours. And I want to highlight that a little bit in this passage because we see that coming forth. We see that coming out. How Jesus even prays to his father, if it were possible, remove this cup. Yet not what I will, but yours. Jesus recognizes that God's will will happen. That whatever he prays, whatever he says, will not change God's will but would rather help him align with that will. So let me talk a little bit about prayer for a moment. Uh, prayer should be word-focused. We don't always talk about prayer, and so that's why I want to take just a moment and, and unpack what prayer should look like. In Psalm 119, verses uh, 147 through 149, here's the psalmist. He says, I rise before dawn and cry for help. I wait for thy words. My eyes anticipate the night watches that I might meditate on thy word. Hear my voice according to thy loving kindness. Revive me, O Lord, according to thine ordinances. Here we get a glimpse at the, the psalmist who is uh, praising God's word. And, and indeed, the 119th Psalm, it's the longest psalm in the Bible, and as well it should be, because it's a psalm of praising God. God's word, the divine gift, the scriptures that he has given to us. And so in this section, we see that the, the psalmist uh, rises up early. He, he gets up early in the morning, and one of the first things he does is he cries to God for help. He waits 
on God's words. He attends to the reading and focusing his life on prayer. What a great way to start the day. You know, if we start the day grumpy or we roll out on the wrong side of the bed, your uh, spouse was snoring all night or uh, you, you, you didn't sleep very well, uh, you wake up and what do you, you're grumpy, right? The first thing in the morning is you're grumpy. Well, one of the ways to help combat that is simply to pray, to, to focus on God and not to focus on how loud your spouse was. At night, 148 there, you know, my eyes anticipate the night watches. Here the psalmist is, is waiting for, for evening to come so the day can come to a close. And what does he do? He goes and sits down on his couch and turns on the game so he can just sit there and watch it. Is that what the psalmist does? Let the TV play in the background while he falls asleep? Did he, he pop open his uh, iPad and watch YouTube for the last few minutes of his day? No. He says, my eyes anticipate the night watches that I may meditate on thy words. So the first thing he does when he gets up is he jumps into prayer, into God's word. And the last thing he does at the end of the day is to jump right into prayer and God's word. And so prayer should be word focused when we are trying to pray. If you're struggling with praying in your life, try just praying the Psalms. If you can't think of the words to say or, or uh, you're, you're struggling with, with where you, you even need to begin, begin with the Psalms. Use the Psalms as a, as a, a springboard for your prayer. Perhaps as you read the Psalm, uh, something will speak to you and you will then uh, offer up a prayer to the Lord. Prayer also opens doors for evangelism. We often think that prayer is something we do privately, which indeed it is and something we should be, but sometimes we often just think prayer is just something we just do here. It's not something that, that affects others or, or should impact others. In Acts chapter 16, verses 25 and 30, but about midnight, Paul and Silas were, were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and, and the prisoners were listening to them. So Paul's in jail. He's been locked up, and he's praying to God. He's praising God, singing hymns. And suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were unfastened. Sometimes prayer can do that. Sometimes it doesn't. But sometimes it does. And when the jailer had been roused out of sleep and had been seen that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword because he was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, do not, excuse me, do yourself no harm. For we are all here. And he came and called for the lights and rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Talk about the power of prayer. It, it, it brought a person to Christ in prayer. And it did a whole bunch of other things, but most often when we pray, when we pray for people, we're praying on behalf of others. When we pray and bring glory to God's name, God opens doors for evangelism, opens doors for us to share with someone how we've been praying for them, what we've been praying for, opportunities to share the gospel. Prayer also prepares us for godly work. Let's jump to Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 13 here. And it was at that time that he went off to the mountain to pray, and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. And when the day came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also named as apostles. So here we see that Jesus is at the beginning of his ministry and he needs to call the disciples to follow him so he can start establishing the, the church. And what does he do? He goes and prays to God for guidance. He goes and prays to God to prepare himself for this, for this ministry, for this godly work that he has been called to do. 
If Jesus needed to pray in order to prepare himself for God's work, you better believe you and I need to pray to prepare ourselves for God's godly work. And so when we are out there living this life, this godly life, going out there and, and sharing the good news of the gospel, do we begin with a word of prayer? Do you start by saying a little prayer to yourself? Or do you dive right in? If you dive right in, maybe that works. Maybe it causes division or strife. Perhaps we should try starting with prayer. Praying get, prepares our hearts for the work of God. Now, sometimes we, we say, and you know, I'm going to be uh, honest, I'm not going to name any names, but sometimes when I ask some of you all to pray, you're like, oh, no, Pastor Ed, I don't, I don't, I don't know how to pray. Oh, I, I, can't, I can't do that. That's all right. That's fine. Let me tell you what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 26. He says, and in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. So don't feel bad when you tell me I don't know how to pray. That's fine. Guess what? The Holy Spirit knows what to say. I want to unpack this a little bit more because in our weakness, that sometimes makes it hard for us to pray. And not just praying out loud publicly, that, that certainly is a challenge, but when we're praying privately, have you ever struggled to pray? Have you ever found it hard to, to, to say the right words? Or have you struggled even to know what to say? And certainly when we're praying out loud, that struggle is, is, seems exacerbated. We don't know what to say, how to say it. Well, here's the beautiful thing. This beautiful thing about prayer is that we have a, a great high priest who sympathizes with our weakness. That's what the author of the letter to the Hebrews tells us. Our high priest. Who is he talking about there? Jesus. He sympathizes with our weakness. And of course, this was prophesied of in Isaiah 53, talking about the, the, the weakness and the suffering of our Savior. Paul touches on this and even says that the, the weakness of God is far stronger than any strength of men. And so Christ here, sympathizing with our weakness, in his humanity grieves the next steps. Let me read that verse to you in verse 34. And he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. That's what Jesus said. In, in, in his humanity, he's so uh, uh, grieving what he knows must come to pass. Now, often we, we, we might shy or, or be nervous about saying something like that, that, that Jesus was, was somehow grieving his, his role. And, and, and that's a fair thing to be wary of. In the first century, they were weary of, of uh, the humanity of Christ because they wanted to lift up the divinity. And, of course, that led to error. We need to have a right understanding of who Jesus is, a balanced understanding. And so here in his humanity, here Jesus as you and me, a man born of flesh, a person born to a mother with brothers and sisters who live a life on this planet. Christ in his humanity grieves to the point of death he, what he knows must come to pass. He knows that he must be forsaken of God. He knows that he will bear our sins. He knows the physical agony that awaits him. And so he bodily grieves. And so he goes to pray. Because he knows the weakness of human flesh. And so when we are weak, in whatever weaknesses we have, that's a perfect opportunity to pray. 
And as Paul said in Romans chapter 8, it's the Spirit who intercedes for us when we pray. This is a beautiful thing. Because if we're struggling with finding those right words, if we're bumbling about, if we're stumbling over what, what we're trying to say and we're messing up words and we're saying the wrong thing, how many times have you prayed like that? Either in your hearts or out loud. You just, you just, just seems to be just blah, blah, comes on out. That's okay. Because guess what? The Spirit is interceding. It's the Spirit who, in a way, turns our, our, our prayers, who burns our prayers into the incense that rises up as an aroma that is pleasing and beautiful to God. Or if sometimes when we pray, you can't even think of words, you just sit there silently because you, you just seem so dumbfounded that, that, that there's no way that you can even say the right thing because if you utter anything, it, it might be selfish or it might be wrong. And so you sit there silently in prayer. Guess what? The prayer intercede or the Holy Spirit intercedes with groanings so deep, too deep for words. And so even in your in your silent grief and your silent prayer, the Holy Spirit is, is groaning on your behalf, lifting up to God even the silent prayers of our hearts. And so we see that prayer is powerful. We need to do it. Christ needed to do it. If you struggle with prayer, remember that Jesus knows that struggle. And he knows that he's given to us his spirit. Now I wanted to talk a little bit about prayer there. There's something else I wanted to unpack in this passage. Something that is a little bit harder to understand. Here Jesus says, in verse 36, that prayer he lifts up, Abba, Father, all things are possible for thee. And this is his prayer. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but thou wilt. Remove this cup from me. What is he talking about there? What is this cup that Jesus is getting well, the main cup that we're looking at is the cup of God's wrath. I know we don't like talking about wrath in church, and we always shy away and say, oh no, God is not wrathful, God, God is not angry. Well, have you read the Old Testament? <laughs> have you read the New Testament? Jeremiah chapter 25. Here, the, the prophet Prophet Jeremiah is such a great book to try and, and read and understand uh, because he's lamenting his people. He, he's living in a world, in a country of unrighteousness, God's country full of unrighteousness. And so he lifts up this prophecy and he lifts it up on behalf of even Babylon. He says in chapter 25, verse 12, then it will be when 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, declares the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans, and I will make it an everlasting desolation. So not only does Jeremiah prophesy the coming destruction of Israel, he even prophesies that the coming destruction of Babylon for their unrighteousness and iniquity. In verse 15, for thus the Lord... The God of Israel says to me, take this cup of the wine of wrath from my hand, from God's hand, and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink of it. So God's wrath is poured out like a cup, like a drink offering. We often love the image of Psalm 23 where uh, the, the, the cup runneth over of God's grace and God's goodness. Well, sometimes the cup runs over with God's wrath, with God's fury, with God's justice being poured out on iniquity. Uh, in the New Testament, Revelation chapter 14. Let me read to you a little bit about the example of the marked. 
And I'll tell you what that means. Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 10. And another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or upon his hand, he also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Whatever the mark of the beast may be, whoever receives it receives the full cup of God's wrath, the object of his just anger against sin and iniquity. And of course, we see this pouring out on Jesus himself. Isaiah chapter 53, that great messianic prophecy, hints us at this in verse 5. 53 verse 5, I had this memorized in my youth. If you went to a Baptist church, you probably had it memorized. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. But not only that, in verse 10, he says, But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. And so the cup of God's wrath is handed over to Christ. That's what he is receiving. That's what he prays that God would perhaps turn away. But of course, he knows God's will. And he knows that he must drink of that wrath. And that's good news for us. Because there's actually two cups going on here. There's an exchange of cups, if you will. As Jesus drinks the cup of God's wrath being poured out on the cross, we receive the cup of God's salvation. Let me jump back to Psalm this time, Psalm 116. And we'll listen here to the cup of salvation. In verses 12 through 13, the psalmist says, What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? So let me back up. Psalm 116 is the psalmist lifting up thanksgiving for God delivering him from his enemies, delivering him even from death itself. And so in light of that deliverance, in light of that redemption, the psalmist says, what shall I render to the Lord? Verse 13, I shall lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. The psalmist recognized that what he had received, the deliverance that he had received, was a gift, a cup of salvation, a cup full of blessing, a cup full of God's grace. And so he lifts it up, lifts it up almost like we would lift a toast at a wedding. He lifts up the cup of salvation, recognizing that he has been given something precious, something he did not earn, something he did not deserve, but something God freely gave to him. And Paul picks this up and tells us that this same cup is credited to believers. In Romans chapter 4, verses 22 and 25, he says this. You who say that one should not commit adultery, do you not commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you not rob temples? You who boast in the law, through your breaking of the law, do you not dishonor God? For the name of God, am I in the right chapter? No. I was like, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> chapter 4. Therefore also it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now, not for his sake only was it written that it was reckoned to him, but for our sake also, to whom it will be reckoned, as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He who was delivered up because of our transgressions was raised because of of our justification. 
And so Paul here touching on uh, who justification by faith as shown in the Old Testament there, he's talking about Abraham being reckoned righteous, not by any work that he did, but by his faith in God's righteousness. And we too, we too are inheritors. We too are credited that same righteousness of Christ. Christ has handed the cup of God's wrath and he drinks it. He drinks it fully. He downs the dregs of God's judgment. And in exchange, he gives to us the cup of salvation. The cup of our being delivered from that same wrath. The cup of our being delivered by his purchase of his blood. And this, of course, is an act of God's grace. Paul says to the church in Corinth, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, He, being God, made him, that is Christ, so God made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In our Sunday school, we talked about the sinfulness of man and how when Luther read passages like this, he came to recognize that sin is so deep, so ingrained in us, and we needed that mediator we needed someone to become sin for us. Someone who knew no sin. When we look at the Bible or you talk to unbelievers or people who, who struggle with the faith, they say, how can, can God be so angry? How can God kill all those people in the Old Testament? The New Testament, you look at uh, uh, Uzzah. Uh, remember his, his story where the Ark of the Covenant is being transported by oxen and and it looks like it's going to fall and tumble into the mud. And, and Uzzah stretches out his hand to try to, to ride it because he doesn't want the Ark of the Covenant to fall down. And what happens to him? He's struck dead by the holiness of God. Well, that doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem fair. In fact, in God's mind, it would have been cleaner for the Ark of the Covenant to fall into the mud because mud is just mud. Mud is not sinful than for man to touch it with his stained hands. Or the example of, of Ananias and Sapphira, who sold their, their property, who, who, who wanted to give to the church, but held a little bit for themselves. God struck them dead. God, why? That seems unfair. That doesn't seem right. Well, they were sinners, tempted, unclean. No, the only innocent person in all of church history, in all world history, to die is Christ Jesus. The only innocent blood shed on this planet was shed for you and for me. And that is an act of God's grace. His judgment fell on Christ rightly, because we deserved it. There's no way our shoulders could carry the burden of God's justice. But Jesus could, and he did. And so our response to this double transfer is actually hinted at in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. In verse 1, Paul says, And working together with him, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. But in everything, commending ourselves as servants of God, in verse 4, in much endurance, in afflictions, in afflictions, in hardships, in distresses, in beatings, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in hunger, in purity and knowledge, in patience, in kindness, in the Holy Spirit, in genuine love, in the word of truth, in the power of God, by the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left, by glory and dishonor, by evil report and good report, regarded as deceivers and yet true, 
as unknown yet well known, as dying yet behold we live, as punished yet not put to death, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing all things. Go back and read those verses 4 through 10 again in your own time. And you'll notice places where perhaps you can pop up. Whether your actions are good, kind, just, or whether your actions are dishonorable. Where do you fall in this? And ask yourself, how are you responding to the cup of salvation that has been handed to you? by the grace of God. Remember, I've used this example before and it doesn't hurt repeating. There will come a day when we'll have to answer that question where every believer will stand before the throne of God and he will say to us, how did you use the life that I purchased? How did you use your life redeemed by the blood of my son how did you use it? Did you waste it? Chasing after your own desires? Or did you use it glorifying God's holy and precious name? We have a response to do. We've received this transfer, not of our own doing, but out of God's free grace. How do we respond? How are we living? Church, that's my question for you. In light of the cup of salvation, in light of the cup of God's wrath being poured out on Christ's shoulders, thanks be to God, because none of us will experience that. How are we living this purchased life? I want you to join with me in prayer. Holy God, I thank you so much for this double transfer, this imputation of Christ's righteousness to us. This is an alien righteousness. It's foreign to us. There's no righteousness that is natural to us. And so, God, we thank you for Christ and his righteousness, that he bore and, and drank the cup of your wrath and is able to give to us the cup of of your salvation. Lord, I pray that we, like the psalmist, can, can lift up thanksgivings, can lift up praise, can lift up glory and honor at receiving that cup of salvation. Lord, I pray that as we think about, come to better understand the, the impact, the full weight of your grace, and the full weight of your wrath on Christ's shoulders. May we come to seek and follow and live the life that you purchased for us. No longer are we slaves of, of sin, but now we have a new master. We're slaves of righteousness. And this is a good thing because our righteous judge has poured out this cup of saving grace into our hands. May we live to honor and glory in that, trusting in the work of Christ, our Redeemer. We pray all this in his precious name and in light of his glorious acts. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is printed in your bulletin, and it's a song of praise of who Christ is in light of what Christ has done. And so I invite you to stand and sing with me the hymn, In Christ Alone. <laughs>
receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and bring you peace. Now the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit go out into this world, living as redeemed children of God. For there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs>